Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good morning, everyone. It is Tuesday, July the 16th, 2024. It is currently 10, 18 a.m. Central Time, and I am coming to you live from the Theology Central studio located right here in Abilene, Texas. Now, as many of you know, as many of you are very aware of, if you've been listening, I have been spending a lot of time, it feels like in some cases hours, monitoring, listening, looking at how Christians, how the church, how different ministries are responding to the assassination attempt on Donald Trump. Trump, the shooting of Donald Trump, the assassination attempt. It does sound like if I have to make sure I directly use the word assassination attempt, our ministries will be very upset because they continue to accuse the mainstream media of not using the term assassination attempt, even though I have got countless evidence that the mainstream media has been calling it an assassination attempt for not for a very for not very long after the initial reports came in immediately they they were they were hesitant to use the term until there was more verification then slowly but surely it started being used by almost all media outlets so i don't know why that's continuing to be thrown out there but i think it's kind of symbolic of what we've been witnessing so i have been monitoring watching listening trying to see how Christians are going to respond to this, to the shooting of Donald Trump, to the assassination attempt, so that we can kind of see how the church is thinking in the present, and we can also kind of get an idea of the direction the church is moving. And what we have found is that in many of the responses, either the responses just are just completely not biblical. It's it's has nothing to do with scripture, nothing to do with theology, completely unbiblical in every way, shape, or form. That is the one thing we've seen. Second, we have seen just a lot of wild accusations, speculations, bearing false witness, misinformation, disinformation, and that has been very disheartening and very frustrating that the church, the church, where people should be able to come to to hear truth, not hear wild accusations, fall, bearing false witness, false information, misinformation, half truths, uh, speculation, slander, almost just wild gossip. I mean, just it just some of it has been absolutely crazy to listen to. Now, again, let me make it very clear: what I'm monitoring, what I am seeing, does not in any way, shape, or form represent the entire entirety of the church. I am looking at responses to this specific event and look and basing what I'm saying about those specific ministries and what they are saying. I am not trying to then extrapolate from that and say the entire church, the whole church, that would not be fair, all right? So what we're looking at is what we're looking at. What you are seeing, what you are hearing is what you are hearing and you can you can definitely offer me links and things that are people are offering a different perspective. But some of what we've heard so far has been very very disheartening discouraging. It's, 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 it's just, it's, it's been negative. I don't even know there's any other way to get around it. And I'm, I'm hopeful that things will be better. Now, from a theological perspective, the only theological thing being said so far, basically about the shooting uh, is basically a, a discussion about God's decrees and God's providence. But when I say a discussion, there's not really been a meaningful discussion about God's decrees and God's providence. It's just basically God stepped in and saved Trump. That's it. Without any, and because God decreed it, it's a part of God's providence, his sovereignty, but there seems to be ignoring something else. Something else continues to be ignored, which is very, 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 very frustrating. Something continues to be ignored, and we and I'm going to mention it again in this broadcast. So here's what my plan is this morning. First, I'm going to look at a response to the uh, assassination attempt of President Trump, um, and I'm and this I received it this morning, 
at 9.24 a.m. So less than an hour ago, I received this email. And the title of the email is My Response to the Attempted Assassination of President Trump. All right, so, and this is from the American Family Association. Now, f- full transparency, you know my feelings about the American Family Association. I, I don't think that there is a group that has, that, I don't think there's a group out there that symbolizes the political hijacking of American Christianity better than the American Family Association and American Family Radio. They are the poster children of a political hijack Christianity. I tell people all the time, you want to hear what a politically hijack Christianity sounds like? Find if you if you don't have it, download the American Family Radio app, listen to American Family Radio from about 10 a.m. Central Time to about 6 p.m. Central Time. And sometimes you won't know if you're listening to Christian radio or if you're listening to, I don't know, your local conservative talk radio channel. Uh, sometimes it sounds so politically hijacked, it's not even funny. Now, I haven't listened in a while, so maybe they have improved. There was a period there that I would all constantly tell people whenever I say that one of the problems in the American church is it's been politically hijacked, I would say, go listen to American Family Radio. Don't, don't take my word for it. Go listen yourself. I don't know if anyone ever took, took me up on that challenge. Now, now again, I haven't listened to it in a while because, because I, it drives me crazy. But I have a feeling that it still probably is somewhat like that. Maybe, maybe not. So if you, if you go check it out, you can draw your own conclusion. Now, the reality is you may love American Family Radio and think it's the greatest thing in the world because you don't see a problem with the political hijacking of the American church it's because I'm obviously I have a different perspective. I think the political hijacking of the American church is absolutely the greatest threat to historical biblical Christianity in our lifetime. Right. I don't know. I, I used to think that it was this or this. I think the political hijacking because the political hijacking goes after conservative churches, conservative churches who have good doctrinal statements, but they basically sell out to political ideology and political focus and political idolatry. And that to me is a problem. And look, we all have idolatry problems. Uh, the human heart, I mean, I mean we, we, we make our, we, we, we are the idol we worship the most, but we find other idols out there. So my, my idol may not be politics. I may never be hijacked by politics. I've got my own issues, but at the same time, we have to deal with the political hijacking. So this is who the email is from. So what we're going to do is I'm going to read this email. And then I was going through my sermons 2.0 app feed, right? Which, you know, I, this is what all of 2024 is about the Sermons 2.0 app. So I was going through my feed and I saw a message said that was entitled, God bless America again. God bless America again. And I'm like, okay, I wonder if they're going to address the shooting. Now it looks like when, when I went ahead and downloaded the audio, part one, it looks like was preached like maybe June 30th. So this would be prior to the shooting. However, it may be a message that they were preaching leading up to July 4th. So this may show patriotism and a political mindset. It may show again some of this patriotic, political hijacking of the American church. The second message, I don't know the date of, but I know this. Hang on, let me look at it. The the second one, God Bless America Again, part two, was uh, showed up in my feed 15 hours ago. And this one is dated Monday, July the 15th. So I'm assuming part two was preached on the Sunday after the assassination attempt. So I want to get to review part two. So in some ways, I was just going to jump to part two to review that. But I'm like, well, let's review part one just to kind of see how they were thinking prior to the assassination attempt. And then later we can come in and review part two and see how they were thinking after the assassination attempt and just kind of get it kind of, it'll, it'll add kind of a different way of looking at all of this. Now, the, the sermon that we'll, we'll be reviewing from comes from, hang on, let me pull this up. Oh, I can get the name. Barry Baptist Church. Barry, B-E-R-R-Y, Barry Baptist Church. You can find it on the Sermons 2.0 app. Please go find Barry Baptist Church and download, stream God Bless America Part 1 and Part 2 
so that you can hear them because I want you to have the, you know, direct source so you don't accuse me of taking anything out of context. And remember, what we, why are we doing these reviews? Why am I monitoring everything? The goal is not just so that I can criticize. Really, it's just, it's not even really about criticizing. I may have a completely radical, well, I'll take this back. I will criticize when, the, when we're reviewing something and the church just descends into wild speculation, accusations, false accusations, bearing false witness, half-truths, mistruths, lies, yeah, that kind of slander, gossip, when, when, when all it leads to is just wild speculation. I mean, the one that we were reviewing last night, I was listening to a little bit more of it today, and it's just so, so, so crazy, so crazy. It, it's just so crazy. So we're going to be, we're going to be talking about a, a lot of things. Now, I know I mentioned God's providence just rem- to remind you, if you go listen to this series that I've kind of been, we've kind of turned this into a series about the assassination attempt on Donald Trump. Um, I did an entire episode where we t- talked about God's providence and God, God's decrees, and we dealt with the not only the theological implications of those, but the very negative implications and how all the people talking about God's providence and God's decrees in Donald Trump being spared they, they will not address the negative side. In fact, not only will they not address the negative side, there's a name that I've yet to hear a pastor, a church, or ministry even say. So far, I'm the only one who has said the man's name, and, I, and I've already been honest with you. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing his last name correctly, but I'm the only one who continues to say the man's name. In fact, I told everyone to take his name, write it down on paper. I, I begged everyone to do that because of all of this situation with the assassination attempt on Donald Trump, this man is going completely unforgotten. Now, God supposedly spared Donald Trump, but nobody wants to talk about, well, God was there sparing Trump, but in the very same area, God chose not to spare someone else. Nobody yet wants to mention that. So we will will talk about that. So that's our goal. We're going to look at the email. Then we're going to review this sermon. The sermon we're going to be reviewing doesn't have anything directly to say in regards to the assassination attempt. At least I don't believe part one does because it was preached before the event. The part two, I'm assuming, leans heavily into that, but we can't go to part two until we review part one. So that's what we're going to do, and we will see. And again, remember, I don't listen to these prior to, so I never know what's going to happen. I don't know if I will agree or disagree. No one can accuse me. Oh, you just find things you disagree with. No, I listen to sermons. I'm encouraging people to spend this year listening to at least one sermon every single day for all of 2024. Well, since I'm going to be listening to it, why not listening to listen to it with everyone live on the air so that we can react in real time? All right. That's what we're doing. Okay. So let's go to the email. Here is the email. Here is the email. Again, I received this just a little over an hour ago. The subject line, the title, my response to the attempted assassination of President Trump. The American Family Association, Tim Wildman, uh, W-I-L-D-M-O-N. All right. Urgent message from Tim, Tim Wildman. Dear, all right, then it has my email address. We were all shocked by the news of the assassination attempt of the former president, Donald Trump. The bullet from a high-powered rifle fired by 20-year-old Thomas Matthew Crooks nicked Trump's ear while he addressed the crowd at a rally in Butler, Pennsylvania, Saturday afternoon. Now, I find it interesting that I have seen numerous Christian responses who will name Trump and who will name the shooter. Someone else continues to not be named. Maybe he will be named in this email. We will see. I firmly believe God spared the life of President Trump. Many of my Christian colleagues share the same sentiment as reported in this American Family News story. All right. So God spared Trump. God saved Trump. That seems to be almost universally. Well, let me take that back. See, 
I, I've got to make sure I speak carefully. I don't, that's, that was way too hyperbolic. It seems a, that it's been a truth that is repeated in everything I have heard coming from the Christian world. God spared Trump in God's providence, God's eternal decree, decree that Donald Trump would not die. He was spared. Praise God. God protected him. God was his cover, his rock, his refuge, his shield. Praise God. Now, but we'll wait and see if someone else has mentioned here. All right. On his truth social platform, Trump wrote, it was God alone who prevented this unthinkable from happening. In this moment, it is more important than ever that we stand united and show our true character as Americans, remaining strong and determined and not allowing evil to win. Although President Trump survived this violent act, we must remember that the gunman took the life of fellow American Corey Comprator, and left two others seriously injured. Now, thank you so very much. Finally, this is the first time Corey's name has been mentioned and everything that I've listened to within the Christian world. This is the very first time uh, in, in emails I've received from other ministries, Corey's name not mentioned. This is the first time Someone has actually mentioned Corey's name. Now, that's great. I just want to make sure it's very clear that while we're sitting there saying God spared Trump, God then did not spare Corey. All right. We just have to acknowledge that. All right. So let me read everything they have to say here. This is awesome. I'm very happy. I'm very, I'm very happy that they did this because this is the first one. This is the very first one. Uh, and again, it was sent out today. So it's Tuesday. It was the first time I've seen. Now, I'm not saying other ministries have it. I just saying from what I have seen and heard so far. Let me read this again. Although President Trump survived the violent act, we must remember that the gunman took the life of fellow American Corey Comprator and left two others seriously injured. I read about how Corey instinctively told his wife and daughters to get down and literally shielded them from the bullets that led to his death. Friends, there's no question that our nation is in deep trouble. Um, Oh, wait, I'm getting, is that another? Okay, I think I'm getting another email from America. I'm getting another email from American Family Radio as I'm reading their, their previous email. Okay, all right, I may have to click on that in a minute. All right, okay, here we go. On his truth social platform, Trump wrote, okay, wait, we read all of that, uh, uh, Friends, there's no question that our nation is in deep trouble. While Americans will continue to disagree on political and social issues, we should be able to agree on this. There's no place for this kind of violence that we saw unfold this past weekend. Man, that's... All right. So, so far, American Family Radio, what what I usually use as the symbol of the most politically hijacked uh, ministry out there. They're the only one so far who's mentioned Corey, and they are emphatically saying, wait, there, there's no room for this kind of violence. And I, and I completely 100% agree. So this, this, is, this one is surprisingly much better than I was anticipating. All right, here we go. Uh, as for the church, I'm reminded of Psalm 107, 19 through 20 which states they then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them out of their distress. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. All right, now let's look at Psalm 107. I'm going to reach down and grab a Bible. Let's look at Psalm 107. Because there's, did, did, you, did you notice something when I read that verse? Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them. Now, this sounds like the psalmist is referencing something that happened in the past. What is he referencing here? Let's go to Psalm 107. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's going to take us about five seconds to know 
who this is referencing. Look at Psalm 107, verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy, and gathered out of the lands from the east and from the west, and from the north and from the south. They wandered in wilderness, a desolate way. They found no city, a dwelling in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried out to the Lord, and in their trouble, he delivered them. Ladies and gentlemen, this is referencing Israel and God's dealings with Israel, not the church. This is dealing with Israel. Absolutely, clearly, this is dealing with Israel. Um, Yeah, I don't know how you can, I mean... Look, they wandered in the wilderness. They found no city. They were hungry and thirsty. I mean, all of that is a reference to Israel. I don't know. Um, but because they rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High, therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. I think this is clear. I think Psalm 107, I'm going to make an argument that the, the the historical context there is it is about Israel. I, I think I'm going to make an argument that that's, that's an accurate way to look at it. I, I think that that's absolutely fair. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm in fact, oh, do I have, I'm looking around here. Hang on one second. I have a giant study Bible over here behind me. I'm just going to look really quick just to see. Psalm 107. All right. Uh, the concept of redemption relates to recovering lost property, buying the freedom of slaves. Okay. This reverse, Psalm 107.3, uh, refers to the return of Israel from exile. Psalm 104, while the wilderness normally implies the wanderings following the exodus, the context suggests the exiles journeyed through the Syrian Ar uh, Arabic desert. The exiles were unable to assimilate in the culture and the lifestyle of their captors, anticipating the Lord's rescue at any time. So this may be a reference to them coming out of uh, maybe Babylonian captivity. Um, so, but it definitely si still seems that, uh, e that we may have some disagreement on how to interpret Psalm 107, but it seems to be Israel, Israel, Israel focused. Now, why do I draw that attention? Because so many times people love to reach into the Bible, grab some verses and say, hey, this is for the church. Ladies and gentlemen, we are not Israel. God made a covenant with the nation of Israel. That covenant with the nation of Israel included promises of protection and provision. We cannot take promises of protection and provision given to Israel and then rip them out of their context and say, God's going to do the same for us. God intervened in very special, supernatural, powerful ways for Israel that we cannot in any way claim that God is going to do anything similar for us. Now, verses that speak of protection and provision for us, well, then we can quote those verses and then try to struggle with how to understand them. But Psalm 107, it's clearly, it seems to be about Israel, all right? But he just quotes it, and then he doesn't say, he doesn't, there, there's nothing else said that, uh, about it. Then immediately the next paragraph says, can prayer save America? I know it can. As American Family Association Vice President, uh, Emeritus Buddy Smith uh, recently wrote in his article titled Politics Aside, Can Prayer Save America? The stresses and woes of our nation today are comparable to critical times in our nation in the past. It could happen again. We have seen him save our country in the past, and we should be calling on Almighty God to do it again. I'm asking you to stop sometime today and pray for America. Pray for the safety, peace, and protection of those who choose to serve in public office. More importantly, I ask you to pray for a spiritual awakening in our nation. Let's sincerely pray that God will change the heart of America. If we will humble ourselves, pray, seek his face, and turn from our wicked ways, perhaps the Lord will do what he promised Israel he would do in 2 Chronicles 7.14, heal our land. Now, I do admit, admire the fact that he does say, hey, what God promised Israel. Now, he doesn't do that in Psalm 107, but he does that with 2 Chronicles 
7, 14. Now, we could get into a big theological discussion here. Can we claim the promise of 2 Chronicles 7, 14? Can we say, if we, if we do what 2 Chronicles 7, 14, then God will heal our land. Can we claim that promise? It would be a conditional promise. If we do exactly what's in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, will God do what he said? I don't know if we can make that a guaranteed promise for us. Is that promise applicable to us? Most preach it like it is, never even bothering to go, well, wait a minute, who's this promise given to? I think it's given directly to Israel, is it not? I mean, even this admits it's given to Israel. So this, I, I am, I'm very grateful that this mentioned Corey's name. I'm very, 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 very grateful. I am truly grateful. You don't even understand how grateful I am. Because I was starting to get very frustrated that everyone, that, you know, the shooter's name is mentioned. Trump's name is mentioned. And then everything about providence and God protecting, we immediately mention Trump. Now, nobody wants to deal with, well, then where was God for Corey? Nobody wants to at least, nobody even wants to acknowledge that. Again, the, most Christians just kind of shrug their shoulders. Now, well, if God wants to protect one, he can. He doesn't want to protect another. That's up to God. God can do what he wants. I understand that. That sounds so, you know, spiritual, but it's not, it doesn't sound so comforting to the people who, who, you know, to the family who lost Corey. Hey, God was right there. Just, I don't know how far Corey was from where President uh, Trump was shot, but hey, you were just this far away and God had the ability to just move Trump a little to the side. So he just gets nicked in the ear, but your husband, nope, couldn't have just been wounded. The bullet couldn't just uh, hit his shoulder, right? Or hit maybe a, his leg. No, 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 no. Gone. That's that's the 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 conflict here. So that one's that's a pretty good response, though. Overall, that's a pretty good response. So that's one of. The, I'm just going to be honest. At this point, of all the ones I've heard, this may be one of the best. And I was, I was already kind of, and see, I, my pre, my, my, my presupposition was that it was going to be negative. And so it turned out to me much better. I'm gl so I'm glad I read the whole thing. Um, I'm going to go to the email that I just received. All right. Um, okay. So this, this is one of their emails about uh, the, oh, here's how we can stop the left's power grab. Right, so this is a very political. Now this is right back to their political one. This is from American Family Radio, um, and this is about voting and stopping the Democrats. Okay, so this is right back to their politics. So they go right back to their politics, which is what they do. They're, again, they're politically hijacked. But their response to the shooting, I, in some ways, is it's one of the best. Even though I may have some issues with how they're quoting, you know, Psalm one hundred and seven, and at least they even admit the Second Chronicles. Hey, that promise was given to Israel. So even, I mean, they do overall relative pretty. I mean, I mean, come on. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to overall say that's great. I'm thankful. That gives me some hope. There's, there's at least hope in that one. Some of the other ones led me to the pit of total despair. So that, that one was from American Family Radio. Again, it was sent at, it's just funny that while we're on the air, they send another email that's just straight up political. <laughs> it just, it, it just, it demonstrates and proves that they're still very political. But I am very grateful that at 930, or 9.24 a.m., 9.24 a.m., American Family Radio sent out their, their response to the attempted assassination of President Trump. I guess technically it's Tim Wildman's response, but I think he's, I think he's like the president uh, of um, American Family Association. I, I don't know exactly his role. I can't remember. He's, yeah, he's the president. He's the, he's the president. Um, so now, yeah, all right. So overall, I think that's a, a, that's a very good email and I'm grateful for it. Now, we'll continue to monitor the responses that are coming in. My primary place of focus is the Sermons 2.0 app and beta.sermonaudio.com because our, that's our focus for 2024 for our Sermons 2.0 app challenge. So I'm going to continue to monitor that, see what people are saying. In the meantime, 
I was looking at my feed on the Sermons 2.0 app because we're supposed to be choosing random sermons, and I saw one called God Bless America Again, part one and part two. Part one was done like June the 30th. Part two showed up in my feed 15 hours ago, and it looks like it was preached on Sunday. So I'm assuming, guessing, my my speculation is part two will be more about the Trump shooting, and part one laid the foundation, and it may demonstrate a very patriotic political viewpoint. It may demonstrate a very Christian. I don't know. I Of course, you can hear my cynicism because of all the things we've been listening to so far, but American Family Radio just gave me a little bit of hope. So I'm going to hope that this is going to be really beneficial to review. So are you ready? Let's go see prior to the shooting, how at least one church was talking about God and America. Let's see what they had to say. Let's process it. Let's think about it. We may not even make it very far, but let's just see what we can learn today. All right. Are you ready? Do you feel a little bit more hopeful? Uh, maybe. I don't know about you. I, I'm just, look, I, I mean it. I, I'm so grateful that American Family mentioned the name of the man who was shot. They mentioned Corey's name. I'm so grateful for that because I don't want him to be forgotten. And I want Christians to face that, hey, in God, God's eternal decree, he decrees everything that occurs. And God's providence, he controls, he upholds, he disposes, he controls basically everything from the greatest to the least. He is sovereign. Okay, well, that sounds good. So we use that and say, see, God intervened and spared Trump. I know, but at the same time, when you say God decrees and he controls everything, meaning that God decreed and controlled everything, which included Corey being killed. You have to embrace that ugly side of it. And, and, and now many Christians just kind of shrug their shoulders like they, they don't have a problem with it. They never have a problem with it until their child is killed by a drunk driver or their child is taken and abused or, or some horrible. Then all of a sudden that gets really real and gets really ugly and gets very difficult to process. So, all right. Well, let's see where this goes. Are you ready? I have no idea. We begin now. Take your Bibles and open with me to the book of Psalms, chapter 33. I'm going to preach about America, our nation, and I want to use some information from this book by Robert Jeffers. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're off to a rocky start. So we're going to be on Psalm 33, but he's going to preach on America. <laughs> okay, All right. I, have a little, I have a little bit of concern uh, because Psalm 33... It's not about America. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So, but we'll, we'll see. Yeah, I, he's going to obviously make it applicable to America. We will see how that works. Robert Jeffress, Jeffress, however you say his name, I'm assuming he's referencing the uh, pastor of First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas, which is not too far from here. And I would definitely um, say that that pastor uh, is a great example, again, of a politically hijacked Christianity. He's more. He's known more from politics than he is for theology. Um, he he's, he speaks on Fox News at different times. Um, yeah. So I got. I, I I'm already worried that he's going to be using a book from him. Uh, that I, and he seems to highly praise this man and wants everyone in this church to listen to him. We have reviewed some of his teaching. In fact, I uh, I, I receive. Uh, I usually receive emails from Robert Jeffers, 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 however you say his name, from his ministry, typically asking for large amounts of money, okay, and which in this part of Texas, it's very hard to take because when they were building what they were quote as their quote unquote campus for First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas, it was all over the media, all over this part of the country. I mean, I'm not that many, I'm not that far from Dallas, and they were like, it's going to cost how much money to build that church? 
what in the world? And it was like some astronomical number. It was insanity. And like, it was a big thing here. So it's sometimes hard when I'm getting emails from him wanting money. And I'm like, I want to send an email back with a picture of where my church is. And it's like, hey, how about you send me a hundred thousand and then I can completely keep my church operating forever. We can remodel the, there's some, we can put an actual pavement down instead of gravel in, in front of our church. We, there's all these things we could actually do. Oh, in fact, if you don't want to do that, just send me, I don't know, $80,000 and I'll pay off my house payment and then I'll be set for the rest of my life. I mean, you want, I mean, the numbers sometimes are ridiculous, the amount they're asking for. And I'm like, what? But okay. So you, you can, you, you can take it or however you want to interpret them. But sometimes it's just frustrating. It's like these ministries, because they don't ask for a little bit. They're usually giving you this, some of these astronomical numbers. Remember, I've had ministries emailing me. They're, they're trying to raise 500,000, 750,000, some almost a million dollars or, or a hundred thousand or 200,000. Like all, and I'm always like, what in the world? Right. You know, that, I don't know. I don't know how to process that. Like, if your ministry needs that much money to operate, what are you doing? And then they're always connected with these large churches. Like, your church is large enough, it should be able to support all of your ministries. So then, yeah, then we get in that never-ending frustration there. But, so that's what he's, uh, he, that, well, you're getting ready to hear, I think. He's getting ready to be, I mean, it sounds like, well, may, well let's let's listen. Maybe I'm, 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 my presupposition is taking over. Maybe I'm, I'm saying he's going to be all positive here, uh, but, I, but may, maybe he's actually going to be critical. So maybe, maybe I'm, maybe I'm being wrong here. Maybe I'm being wrong. Maybe I'm, I, I, look, that's, it's true. I'm, I'm, I'm projecting here. I'm projecting. So let, let's, let's be fair. Let's see where he's going to go. He said... America is a Christian nation. So I want to give credit to the person that wrote this book. And matter of fact, he preached on it this morning. How many, how many heard Robert Jeffers? Anybody listen to Robert Jeffers? Boy, you're missing a blessing. You got, you got satellite. He's on about three times on Sunday mornings. And he has the most beautiful choir you ever heard in your life. And an orchestra. All right, so he he he's all into Robert Jeffress. He's he's he thinks obviously so I was right. He he's he's praising him. But he quoted him, he's like, hey, one it gives credit because Robert Jeffress, I think is how he's stating the name, it says America is a Christian nation. America is a Christian nation. Now, we've I've told you to write down things about God's decrees, God's providence. And I've given you questions, right? Now I want to give you a question. Here is your question for the day. You ready? Is America a Christian nation? Present tense. Has America ever been a Christian nation? Past tense. Will America ever be a Christian nation? Future tense. Is it? Has it? Will it? That's what I want you to talk and debate today. Is America a Christian nation? Has it been a Christian nation? Will it ever be a Christian nation? My answer is an emphatic, it isn't, it hasn't, nor will it ever be. And I don't ever want it to be. I don't want a national religion. In any way, shape, or form. I don't want it to be. Because you say, well, America is a Christian nation. Exactly which Christianity are we referring to? Do you want it to be a Catholic Christian nation? Where Catholicism is the national religion and Protestants are imprisoned? Or, or, or somehow their civil laws passed to persecute, kill, imprison those who disagree with Catholicism? I mean, this, I mean, if you know anything about church history, anytime the church and state come together, someone's going to die. Do you want it to be a Jehovah's Witness Christian nation? 
Do you want it to be a Mormon Christian nation because they both would claim association with Christianity? Do you want it to be Greek Orthodox? Do you want it to be Lutheran? Do you want it to be Presbyterian? Do you want it to be charismatic? Oh my goodness, I would pack up and get, I would get out of this nation so fast. I would be gone. You know how I feel about charismatic theology. I'd be, I would, I would run for my life. I would just, I would tell everyone to flee. All right. Do you want it to be Baptist? Well, which kind of Baptist? Which kind of Lutheran? Which kind of Presbyterian? Who would be the ones in charge? See, just to see a Christian nation, that doesn't mean anything. We got to define the Christianity you're referring to. Because ladies and gentlemen, there's a lot of different kinds, all making exclusive truth claims, which says the others are completely wrong, fraudulent, and may even claim that the others are not even truly Christian. But I'm going to argue that it never has been, never will be, and nor do I ever want it to be. And I'm going to base it on some of the following. All right. Now, typically, you hear frequently in many churches that America is a Christian nation. And I will argue that this is a very complex and a debated topic, if you're even remotely honest with the subject. Now, I think it's very fair to say the United States has had a significant Christian population and foundation. It is important to recognize that America as a nation is not officially a Christian nation in terms of its governmental structure. And, and, and it's really weird. On one hand, pastors will say, America is a Christian nation. And then five seconds later, they'll say, America is filled with all of these people who profess Christianity, but they're not really saved. So is America a Christian nation because people are Christians? Or are you telling me that America is filled with all false professors? So are they really Christian or not? If they're not really Christian, then, and all, most of the people who claim to be Christians are not really Christians, then how do you even come close to saying it's a Christian nation? Because then you would say the reality of true Christian, Christianity is small, 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 small. So is it either most of the nation is Christian or most of the nation is just made up of false professors? Which is it? Because Christians will go back and forth. They'll, one minute they'll say, well, most of America's Christian. And the next minute they'll say, well, most of the American, America's possess, profess Christ, but they don't possess him. Well, then, then it's not a Christian nation, right? Even from just a, 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 you know, majority perspective. Here are, I think, some points to consider. The United States was founded on the principles of religious freedom as reflected in the First Amendment of the Constitution, which prohibits the establishment of a state religion. This ensures that people of all faiths or of no faith have the right to practice their beliefs without interference from the government. And that's the way we want it to be. I do not want a state religion. I want people to have their freedom to believe or not to believe. And I want them to have their freedom to believe whatever they want to believe and exercise their faith. Unless, of course, it's going to call for violence or death or, the, well, you know where there would be some limits. But other than that, I want people to have as much freedom as possible. I want the Buddhist to have freedom. I want the Muslim to have freedom. I want the Satanist to have freedom. Because the freedom denied of others is a freedom that I'm ultimately denying myself. It's not a Christian nation. It's, plur it's religious pluralism. This nation was founded for people to have religious freedom. Now, we, now let's be very honest. It didn't always practice that, especially in areas where the Puritans took over. In many cases, they, they persecuted and, and prohibited anything else which they came here for freedom and then denied people the very freedom they so want, wanted for themselves. In some cases, not in every case. Now, religious pluralism, as a nation is concerned, is a good thing because everyone has freedom. Religious pluralism from a theological perspective is not a good thing, okay? We don't want religious pluralism in the church. We don't want religious pluralism in our theology, but we want it in our nation because then people are free and we want that religious freedom. If we deny their freedom, guess what? We'll then have our freedom denied whenever the people we denied 
comes to power. And that's what you see in church history. If the Catholics controlled an area, Protestants were persecuted. If Protestants were in charge of an area, Catholics were persecuted. If Lutherans were in charge, and then it went, it's, it, and this constantly happened. If this person was in charge or this group was in charge, then Athanasius was ex- exiled from the area and had to go. We can go through church history where some of the church fathers faced persecution or are being exiled because, well, another group took over. And then once that group went away, then another, then, then they could come back. And it's just ridiculous. That's not the way Christianity should be. F- f- we, we, there's no call for that connecting it to political, the political world. That's just, that's just nothing good that comes from that. So religious pluralism is more, we could, we could also more of a secular government. The U.S. government operates as a secular entity, meaning it does not endorse or promote any specific religion. The separation of church and state is a foundational principle to prevent religious discrimination and ensure equality of all citizens, regardless of their religious beliefs. It's a more secular form of government. We do not want a, a theocracy of any kind. We don't want a theocratic monarchy. We don't want anything like that. The church can be theocratic. The church can be religious. The church can do. The government is to be more secular in its approach. A diverse religious landscape. The United States is a diverse country with people practicing various religions, including Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism, and others. The diversity of beliefs and values contribute to the country's rich tapestry and demonstrates that America is not exclusively a Christian nation. It's not exclusively a Christian nation. It is not exclusively a Christian nation. It is not exclusively a Christian nation. While Christianity has obviously played a significant role in shaping American history and culture, the founding fathers intentionally established a secular government to prevent the pitfalls of religious persecution and ensure the freedom of conscience for all citizens. The United States courts have consistently upheld the separation of church and state ruling against attempts to impose religious beliefs through government institutions. This legal framework reinforces the idea that America is not a Christian nation and in official capacity. These points highlight the complexity of the issue and the importance of recognizing the diverse and inclusive nature of American society, which represents the religious beliefs and freedoms of all of its citizens. Now, this is the way I would say you want America to be a Christian nation. You want it. You don't do it through force. You don't do it through voting. You know how you do it. You pray, fast, preach, and evangelize. And if everyone in America becomes a a Christian, if everyone in America becomes a Christian, then I guess you could refer to it as a Christian nation. But even if everyone in America became a Christian, you know what I would still want? I would still want the freedom of religion and still no state-endorsed religion. Because even though if everyone in America became a Christian and they all became the same kind of Christian, well, what happens when someone comes to power and decides, hmm, you know what? I've decided to become Catholic and we're going to get rid of all of these denominations because this is a Christian nation, but it's a Catholic Christian nation. So you don't want, you don't ever want it to turn into that. You want it to maintain that separation and no state endorsed religion, no state religion of any kind. We want that freedom. And maybe that's my Baptist side of me. I think Baptists historically have been very much ones to argue for. We don't want that. We want freedom. I want you to be able to build your church across the street and say whatever ridiculous things you want to say and preach whatever you want to preach. And I want the freedom to say you're wrong. And I want you to have the freedom to say I'm wrong. And I want the, I want the Muslims to be able to build a mosque right across the street and, and practice their religion. And I want the freedom to be able to say they're wrong. And I want them to have the freedom to say that I'm wrong. So this is off to a, an interesting start. This is off to an interesting start. I'm going to back this up now. So now you can hear all of that in its context. Here we go. 
Take your Bibles and open with me to the book of Psalms, chapter 33. I'm going to preach about America, our nation, and I want to use some information from this book by Robert Jeffers. He said America is a Christian nation. So I want to give credit to the person that wrote this book. And matter of fact, he preached on it this morning. How many, how many heard Robert Jeffers? Anybody listen to Robert Jeffers? Boy, you're missing a blessing. You got, you got satellite? He's on about three times on Sunday mornings. And he has the most beautiful choir you ever heard in your life. And an orchestra. And yes, they use drums, but they use it rightly. And they use violins, and they use it right. And they use trumpets and trombones, and I don't know what all the other things are, but it's some of the greatest praise music. Now that's real praise music. It praises the Lord, not the devil, and not the flesh. And I'm going to say more about that a little bit later on. Okay, while you're looking for Psalms 33, let me invite you to our church. We're an old-fashioned, independent, missionary, Bible-believing, Bible-preaching Baptist church. We have two services on Sunday morning only, 10 and 11 a.m., we have a service also starting today, the 30th of July, 30th of June, Sunday school. We're having Sunday school today for children uh, 4 to 11 years old. On Wednesday night, we have at 6 o'clock a Bible study for the adults and also a large active youth program for young people 4 through 19 years old. Also, you can hear us on the radio every Sunday morning at 8 o'clock on WIOK. 107.5 on the FM dial, and 10 o'clock Sunday morning on WCYN, 1400 on the AM dial. One verse of scripture for my subject. That's crazy, Harry. That that just blows my mind in 2024. You're telling everyone you're broadcasting on radio. Why wouldn't you be telling everyone where to get the podcast from? Like I sometimes churches when they talk, it's like, are we still like 30 years ago? Why why, why would every, hey, you can tune in at this time to hear us on the radio? Why wouldn't you just say, go to any of your favorite podcasting app, look up our church, and you can listen to us whenever you want? <laughs> It's it's 2020. Hey, at 8 a.m., you can tune in and hear us on radio. <laughs> what? Why wouldn't you just say, or you could just download your favorite podcasting app, Apple Podcasting app, or our Pocket Cast, or, or Overcast, or, or, or Spotify, or Pandora, or Amazon Music, or Deezer. I'm just naming apps that have podcasts on them. And you, you can, and look for our church. And ladies and gentlemen, you can, like, why? I, that seems so. Sometimes I'm, I'm list, I listen to churches and I'm like, what year are we in? What year? Uh, I don't understand what year we're in anymore. I, I always make the joke that the church is 20 years behind. Like that, like that sounds like it's like something from the 1970s or right? from the 1980s, maybe even the 1990s. Okay. But at some point we moved on. All right. Now everyone has a phone and on that phone, <laughs> they have access to this thing we call the internet. And they and they have access to their cell phone service, and they can access things, right? And they can download these things called apps. And these apps, well, many of them are right where we call them podcast apps, or they're uh, apps that have other content, but they also have podcast on them. And then they and then you take your messages, you upload them, and then well, once you upload them to a podcast hosting site then that podcast hosting site will distribute them to all of these other sites and then people can download your content and they don't have to wait till 8 a.m. 8 on a Sunday <laughs> or 10 a.m. on a Sunday or 6 p.m. on a Saturday and, and, and try to ensure that they have radio reception to be able to pick up the radio station. They could just... That is bizarre. That That's truly... That's a blast from the past. That's what... That is. Okay, so Psalm 33... Here we go. Here we go. Psalm 33. Chapter 33 of Psalms, verse 12. 
Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. The question I want to ask, is America a blessed nation or a cursed nation? The nation that reverence God will be blessed by God. A nation that rejects God will be rejected by God. I want to preach on the subject, God bless America again. The problem in America is a heart problem. We as America needs a heart transplant by the great physician. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are about to get into some theological issues. Okay, so first of all, Psalm 33, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. Now, I would ask you, can that in any way, shape, or form reference America? Or does that primarily have a focus on maybe, I don't know, the nation of Israel, whom God has chosen for his inheritance, right? God chose Israel, made a covenant with them. There's promises in that, okay? All right, so you can just deal with that. But here's the thing, all right? Now, I know this gets controversial, but that's okay. We have to deal with this. He says what America needs is a heart transplant, a national heart transplant. Now, for a heart transplant to occur would mean every person in America would have to receive a new heart. So here's the thing. I know this is typically taught in most churches. I've asked people to draw a chart trying to map this out, and everyone's acknowledged that when you listen to lots of sermons, you will come away totally and utterly confounded and confused, because at times it's so contradictory. So I know that most Christians believe that practically speaking, practically, when you become a Christian, you become a new creature, the old is gone and everything is new, meaning that the old nature is gone, the old heart is gone, you have a new nature, a new heart, now you can say yes to God and you can say no to sin. Now, if you truly believe that to be true practically, well, then basically Christians not only can be perfect, they should be perfect because they have now nothing internally keeping them from spiritual perfection. They have nothing but a new nature, a new heart internally, and that should drive all of their external behavior, and it's flowing from, which is basically perfect on the inside. Now, Christians will almost talk that way, and then five seconds later say, however, you're never going to be truly sinless. You're going to continue to fight. You're going to continue to struggle. Wait a minute. What am I fighting and struggling? If I'm a new creature, the old is completely gone, and everything is new, then I should be basically perfect. But then you can't turn around and say, well, no, nobody can be perfect. Well, then what's keeping me from perfection if I have a new heart and a new nature? Now, some people will say, well, you get a new heart and a new nature. They may speak of those two things as being separate, but then they say the old heart and the old nature remain. So now you've got two natures and two hearts. Others will say heart and nature is synonymous of the same thing. So now you had an old nature slash heart. Now you have a new nature slash heart. So you have both inside of you. And the way it was preached to me early in my Christian life, you have two natures inside of you. Think of them as like, you know, two dogs. And the one you feed the most will become stronger. So if I feed my new nature more, it will become stronger over my old nature. And how do you feed it? Well, if I read my Bible more, go to church more, listen to sermons more, then it will be so strong it can dominate and control the old nature. If I don't feed the new nature, the old nature will rise up and be more dominant. So you've got these two going on inside of you. So some people almost speak of it like you have four. Some people speak of you have two. Some people speak as if the old is completely gone, right? And and obviously there's no agreement in Christianity about this. So If you say everyone gets a new heart, does the old go away? Now, I've also heard it talked about that, that in a sense, sin comes knocking on your door. And you have to decide who's going to answer the door, your old nature, your new nature. 
which again, almost makes you sound schizophrenic, makes you sound like, well, then how do I control it? All right. So, so th- some people make it sound like, how does it work? If you get a new heart, is the old gone? Or is the new, like, how does it work? Nobody seems to be able to clearly articulate it. I know this. When it's, the Bible says that if anyone's in Christ, is a new creature, old things are passed away, all things are become new. That is not anything to do with you practically. That is your positional standing before God. Because of his imputed righteousness, you stand before God, a new creature, the old is gone, everything is new, positionally, practically, and all evidence would indicate this, you're still a sinner. You still have a sinful nature. You still have a sinful heart. That's why you still sin and you will continually to sin. And that's why you can never obey God's law anywhere close to perfect. Why? And that's why we are saved by an imputed righteousness, not an infused righteousness. The entire Reformation came down to that distinction. Imputed, not infused. A spiritual heart. Now, let me say some things about America. Number one, take notes, please. The devil has a grip on our country. Has a grip on our country. Our nation was founded upon Christian principles. Don't you ever forget that. Now, they're trying to get rid of that in schools and and public places. They're trying to erase the name of God and no mention of God in anything worth having But we were built on a Christian principles. Now, I want to show you this, and and it's quite lengthy, but it's... Now, if Satan has got his hand or control kind of America, why did God let him do that? So, well, God didn't. So God's not in charge. Now, he's getting ready to go. America was founded on Christian principles. Again, I've already kind of gone through the way the nation was actually structured. That Christianity obviously was influential. We cannot deny that. You cannot deny the influence of Christianity. I mean, you'd be a fool to say that. But the issue is it was never a established Christian religion. There was not a state religion. That was the whole thing. America was not to do that. They were fleeing religious persecution. Don't do that. When you come here, don't do, even attempt. But there were attempts to do that early on. Now, he's going to say something lengthy. We're already at an hour. Of course, these all go so fast. So I may I may just do a little bit uh, to see what he's getting ready to say. He, he's, this is probably going to turn into a never-ending, like he's going to quote some historical facts. I could go check other historical. This is going to turn into that kind of argument. Okay, but here we go. Worth hearing. First of all, let me read this to you about our fi- founding fathers. Our founding fathers. Fathers. Ben, Benjamin Franklin suggested that the uh, Constitutional Convention should seek God's blessing in an opening prayer at every session. During the meeting on June the 28th, 1787, Franklin said, I have lived a long time. And the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth that God governs the affairs of men. Sound like he believed in the sovereignty of God. He said, and if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his knowledge, it is probable that an entire can raise without his age. Can it? No, cannot rise without his aid. Okay, he's quoting Benjamin Franklin. Now, Benjamin Franklin's religious beliefs are a topic of great debate among scholars and historians. He was raised in a pure, basically in a pure, as a Puritan and had appreciation for religious principles. His personal beliefs evolved throughout his life, leading to some ambiguity regarding his religious affiliation. Here are some points to consider regarding Benjamin Franklin's view on religion. Deist tendencies. Franklin often associated with deism, a religious and philosophical belief that that basically puts forth the idea of the existence of a creator who established the universe but does not intervene in human affairs. Deists typically reject organized religion and emphasize uh, reason and nature as source of spiritual insight. 
diverse religious interests. Franklin showed an interest in various religious traditions, including Christianity, but also explored uh, other faiths uh, as Quakerism and Freemasonry. He valued ethical teachings and moral virtues found in different religions rather than subscribing to strict dogma. Franklin's public statements and writings often reference God and religious concepts, reflecting a belief in a divine power and moral order. However, he was critical of religious hypocrisy and superstition, advocating for a rational approach to spirituality. Throughout his life, Franklin expressed commitment to various uh, living, personal, uh, to uh, virtuous living, personal integrity, and social responsibility. His emphasis on ethical behavior and civic engagement aligned with many religious values, even if he did not adhere to traditional Christian doctrine. In conclusion, while Benjamin Franklin's religious beliefs may not fit neatly into a conventional Christian category, his complex views on spirituality, morality, and philosophy demonstrate a very nuanced approach to faith. Franklin's legacy as a thinker, inventor, and statesman reflects a practical and pragmatic worldview shaped by diverse influences. Now, it's always amazing That when people want to go back and people do this, the same thing that people do the same thing with the church fathers drives me crazy. They do it with our founding fathers. They do it with the early church fathers. If you are Baptist or or reformed, you go find things from the church fathers to see, see, they think just like they thought just like we did and then ignore everything else they said. I said, you see this with baptism. See, 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 they, they, they believe in baptizing babies and they also believed in baptizing people in the nude. (laughs) They also believed in all of these things you have to do in order to be baptized. You don't believe any of that. So it's like everybody wants to go to the church fathers or the founding fathers to only read into them what you believe and what you think instead of letting them be who they are. We say this about the church fathers, let them be who they were. Don't make them into something they're not. They're not a member of your first Baptist church or your first Lutheran church. They were who they were with their own thoughts and ideas. What we do is go see what they thought, unless we're going to assign magisterial authority to them. There's no need to go. What, what, what do you gain by saying, well, this church father agrees with me? Well, congratulations. Are you saying they have magisterial authority? No. Then who cares if they agree with you? You can give me a list of 15 church fathers who agrees with you. I don't care because I thought as a Protestant, the Bible is the authority, not the church fathers. And guess what? You can go and try to make the church, uh, the founding fathers. Well, see, they said this and they said this and they said that. Okay. The argument is we don't want this nation to be a Christian nation because we don't want a state religion. And if you want that, you're not thinking of the unintended consequences of it. But see, he's only going to give us certain quotes by Franklin. He's not going to go into the complexity of Franklin's beliefs because, well, that doesn't quite fit the narrative. We have been assured in the sacred writings, which is your Bible, that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Do you notice what he's doing? Remember he said he was going to use that book by Robert Jeffress, right? And I do believe it's Jeffress. I do believe that's the way you say it. If I, if I said it incorrectly, I apologize. I do believe it's Robert Jeffress. Or maybe he said it differently. I don't know. Some One of us said it differently. Um, now, please note, he's using that book. Now, class, what is this called? Is he using primary source or secondary source? He's using a secondary source. So then you would have to go grab that book by Robert Jeffress to see if there's footnotes. Then go find the primary source, find out when Franklin supposedly said this or whichever church father said it, and then say, okay, now let's go look at a broader look at all of what Franklin believed and then understand these contexts in that broader context. But he's using a secondary source that's making references to other sources. And then you, and you don't know if Robert, is Robert Jeffress using the primary source or is he taking it from a secondary? So this may not even be a secondary source. This may be third. This may be way, because a lot of times what happens, pastors will pick up a book and say, well, this person is quoting 
you know, Benjamin Franklin. And then you go follow the footnote, go, no, he's not actually quoting Benjamin Franklin. He's quoting from a book that supposedly is quoting from Benjamin Franklin. Then you go follow that footnote and that's actually quoting from a book supposedly. Qu- and nobody is actually quoting from an original source. They do, people do this with church fathers all the time. Well, this book said, this church father said this. I'm like, well, where's the actual source from the church father's writings? Now, at least that's what I think he's doing, because it sounds like I hear him turning pages, and he said he was going to be using that book. So I'm assuming he's referencing, he's got it marked in the book. He's not stating where he's getting the the quote from. I'm not denying the legitimacy of the quote. I'm just saying, whenever we're going to deal with the church fathers or the founding fathers, it's never as black and white as we always like to make it. We always want to put them in our jersey and our and our theological team, our own, or our political team, and it, it drives me crazy how we do that. Major states had a religious requirement in order to hold any sort of political office. For example, here's what every elected or appointed official in Delaware had to subscribe to, according to Article 22 of the state com- constitution. I do profess faith in God the Father and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, and the Holy Ghost, one God, blessed forevermore. And I do acknowledge the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be given by divine inspiration. That message Terry Leach preached last week was a classic. I've never heard in 56 years of ministry, I've never heard a greater sermon on the Word of God. I mean, it was a classic sermon about the Bible. Let me go on. George Washington, our first president. Now, the Delaware religious test, there, there was a test uh, in the Delaware Constitution of 1776. It contained provision that required all office holders to profess faith in God and do a firm belief in the Christian religion. This requirement effectively served as a religious test for public officials, limiting eligib- elig- eligibility based on religious beliefs. However, over time, the influence of this religious test waned as Delaware and the United States more, moved towards a more secular approach to governance. The U.S. Constitution's Establishment Clause, which prohibits it's the government from establishing favoring any particular religion played a significant role in the eventual elimination of religious tests for a fi- office holding at both the federal and state levels. Please note the U.S. Constitution ultimately led to the elimination of religious tests. On one hand, Christians are like, the Constitution, the Constitution. On the other hand, we forget the Constitution. Is he saying we want a religious test? Or is he saying that that was a good thing? Does he say we want a Christian, a, a, a national state religion? Religious tests for holding public offices are generally considered unconstitutional in the United States as they violate the principle of religious freedom. Delaware, like other states, has removed such requirements from its laws and constitutions to uphold the separation of church and state and promote religious freedom and equality among all citizens. Now, so on one hand, there is truth to that, but it did go away. Now, it's, I think it's being read in a sense that people, I wish we could go back to the good old days. No, I don't want to go back to the good old days. I don't want a national religion. I don't want a state religion. I don't want anything like that. In his first inaugural address, he said, he said, um, being almighty God who rules over the universe, except for God. John Adams, the second president of our country, wrote, The general principles on which the fathers achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. I will avow that I then believed and now believe that those general principles of Christianity are as eternal and immutable as the existence and attributes of God. Our Constitution, he went on to say. Now, he quoted George Washington again, 
Just take a little bit of research here. George Washington's religious beliefs have been a topic of discussion among historians and scholars. While Washington was known to attend Christian services and reference God in his writings and speeches, the specifics of his personal faith remain a subject of debate. Episcopal background. Washington was raised in the Anglican Church of England and regularly attended services throughout his life. He was familiar with Christian uh, Christian teaching and values. Now, please note, Benjamin Franklin was was raised Puritan. He's raised of the Church of England. All right. So, mm, and then ultimately Episcopalian, raised in the Anglican Church of England, the Anglican Church of England. So, um, we, we, now, w- which one gets to be in charge? Again, w- this is this is what we lead to. But here, once again, we saw this with Benjamin Franklin. Deistic influence. Some historians suggest that Washington's beliefs may have been influenced by deism, a philosophical position that acknowledges a creator but does not adhere to specific religious doctrines. Washington's reference to a supreme architect or providence and his writings have been interpreted as reflective of deistic ideas. Washington was known to be private about his personal beliefs, rarely discussing religion openly. This has led to varying interpretations, the depth of his Christian faith. So once again, it's not as easy as everyone makes it out to be. Now, again, I'm just doing real-time research. I'm utilizing artificial intelligence to do some of this. So, but immediately I'm asking. Now, I'm not saying that this is that... I'm just saying he's giving quotes, not telling us where the quotes are coming from, and there's no context in which to to establish this. And if George Washington, and, and even if you're quoting some of these certain things that he's quoting, some of these things, how do they ultimately play out in a governmental setting once the Constitution is established and once we start trying to then, how do we, this these constitutional requirements and the way that this kind of a almost a secular form of government, how is that going to play out with the desire for many to almost have a more religious, almost a state or, or, or national religion? Well, clearly, the more secular approach ultimately wins out. And I think ultimately it was beneficial because you had we came here to flee religious persecution. Say was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Our forefathers designed this country and its constitution with the assumption that the people would be guided by a belief in and obedience to God. John Jay was the first chief of justice. Again, well, in a God... Maybe some believed in the God. Maybe some had just the idea of just a general... Supreme being, obviously theism was dominant at that time. Theism was, obviously theism was dominant. Theism is not Christianity, ladies and gentlemen. But again, even if that's the case, is that the way the government should be established? That's the issue. So we're going to stop there. Again, that's God Bless America again, part one. We didn't really make it very far. We didn't really, we got into some basic issues. You should go listen to the rest. Um, Maybe we'll do some more review of it. Maybe we want to get to part two because I think then it will probably have much more of a response to the shooting. But so what we learned in this hour plus is that American Family Radio is the first ministry to respond to the shooting of Donald Trump and actually give the name of the person who was killed at the rally. I appreciate them do, doing that. Once again, God is being spoken of as his providence, his sovereignty, stopping the bullet, but no one addresses then why doesn't God, didn't God stop the bullet for the other person? No one still wants to address that. Nobody wants to, that's just like, I, I don't know why. Nobody wants to be confronted with that. And then we're listening to a sermon about God blessing America again, based on Psalm 33. It just immediately somehow assume Psalm 33 has something to do with the United States of America, and then making a lot of claims about er, the early America, almost calling for almost, it sounds like, some form of a national or state religion. I don't know if they're going to go that far. And we addressed some of those issues and did a little bit of research. There we have it. That's what we've accomplished today. As I continue to monitor how the church is responding to the shooting of Donald Trump. And again, the reason we're reviewing this sermon is because this is part one. The part one was prior to the shooting. Part two was preached after the shooting. So since it's part of a two-part kind of mini-series, 
then I wanted to put the two parts together. So maybe we'll do more review. We will see. But I challenge you to go listen to both so that you can hear their perspective. Most of you will agree with his perspective because I think most Christians do want some form of a I think I think we're almost reached that the point. I think the majority of Christians today almost want some kind of a national state religion. I think they do. I think we would have to do some surveys on it. But I think most American, most Christians, let me say, most conservative Christians almost want that today, and I, that that's frightening to me. That's frightening to me. But so. I will stand in the minority there. Maybe I'm in the majority. I don't know. I think if you take all of Christendom, I think the majority will be like, no, 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 no. But I think if you take a subset and you take very conservative Christians, they almost want a, a Christian nationalism, a, a state or, or, or national religion. And that is, uh, I don't, that's, that's the direction I don't want the church to go. I don't. And I would argue church history proves that whenever those two merge, state and the church, people are going to die. And the rights you deny others will be rights ultimately denied you. And that works great when state and religion work together, when it's your form of Christianity that's in charge. When your form of Christianity is no longer in charge or another religion takes over, well, then you're going to regret ever wanting that. There we go. You can email me, newsif at yahoo.com. That's newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. Everyone have a great day. God bless.